Dear honored guests, Principal E.K., CHS uh, staff, parents, grandparents, and family, friends, and most importantly today, the class of 2013. Uh, Megan, I'm not sure at what point today you learned that your parents were doing this, but by the look on your face when it was announced, I think it maybe was uh, just a few moments ago. So uh, we actually chose to keep it a secret lest you perhaps choose to skip this afternoon and have to endure just one more lecture by your parents and to make it worse this time in public. Uh, but, uh, you know, this you had no more in say, say in this as, uh, as you did in those renovation projects and the camping trips with the big yellow canoe that you alluded to last night in your uh, lovely parent tributes. So no choice in this today. Class of 2013, uh, it's an honor to address you as witnesses giving testimony of God's work in your lives as we've watched, in some cases up close and in others from a distance, for some your whole life and for others just a year or two. As I listened last night to uh, the football team's tribute to Mr. Ken Ginter, I couldn't help but think of my first official connection with CHS when Mr. Ginter invited me to be his assistant coach to the uh, girls uh, Cougar basketball team in my final year of college here at Briarcrest. So 30 year anniversary of being connected to CHS that way. Uh, Ken and Judy have always lived a life of service and mentorship, and I have uh, them to thank very much for uh, that first step and that transformation of me being a player with worn out basketball knees to uh, being a coach and eventually uh, my life career. A number of you um, up here as well, actually, uh, we had a privilege to coach you when, we, when I returned to that role just a few years ago when Stan and our oldest daughter, Jill, uh, helped to coach some of you when you were in grade 9 and 10 when you played up on the senior girls uh, basketball team. And it's just so great to see you up there in cap and gown today. Many of, uh, many of your teachers, coaches, directors um, have planted seeds of confidence in many of you in the area that you have a special interest in, uh, a God-given talent that, uh, that's been gifted to you. And uh, we just pray that as you leave this place, uh, we anticipate and trust that you're gonna choose to nourish those seeds uh, as you journey on. This weekend's theme of being transformed into his image is a powerful concept to understand and to undergo. One of the ways we're directed by scripture to do this is by the renewing of our minds, taken from the passage Lori just read, with a focus on Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Graduates, as you head into your future, as you move from dependence to independence, we want to encourage you to become all that God has created you to be by renewing your mind through the truth only found in God as revealed in Jesus and confirmed by the Holy Spirit. Our thinking is, is a foundation of the way we live our lives. Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as he thinks in his heart, so he is. The number ratio 136 can help us understand the power of the mind. The number one relates to the, to the power of the idea that I can communicate. I can only communicate one idea at a time to you verbally. Even though I might want to create more than that or say more than that, I can only actually say one idea at a time. The number three relates to how fast your minds can process the idea. You can agree, disagree, you can think of uh, examples that um, would relate to it, confirm it, or deny it. But it's the number six that relates to the power of our self-talk, the things that we believe about our faith, circumstances, and self. Our self-talk is six more times powerful than the words I can say to you. So what's the recorder that's playing in your head right now has six times the power over anything that I can say to you. It is a self-talk that creates a pattern of how we live our lives as conformed or transformed. 
So if we acknowledge that self-talk is six, six times more powerful than the words we hear from others, how can we actually change our self-talk by transforming, to be transforming? Steve Buckland has written a book called Let's Just Laugh at That to identify common lies that lead to bondage and how truth transforms us as God's adopted children. As a family, we've been reading through this book and we'd like to share a few of his thoughts with you today. Within our thinking, there are some basics that we need to understand. First, truth brings hope. Truth brings hope. Truth always brings hope. Romans 15, 13, how now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Hope fills us the moment we believe, truth. Hope is a confident expectation that good is coming. Our hope level is the indicator of whether we believe truth or lies. Our hopelessness about a problem is, big, is a bigger problem than the problem. I'll repeat that. Our hopelessness about a problem is a bigger problem than the problem. There is no hopeless circumstances, circumstances, only hopeless people. Once someone gets true hope, the circumstances cannot stay the same. The battle is between truth and lies. John 8:32 says, "The truth shall make you free." The kingdom of God is not pr primarily moved by good conduct but it is moved by good beliefs. The new covenant believer is to be more belief focused than conduct fo focused. We can have great doctrine concerning the foundations of faith but still be spiritually weak because we believe lies. Renewing our minds now transforms our future experience. We transform our tomorrow by renewing our minds today. That's what Romans 12 two says. We don't need a new set of circumstances as much as a new set of beliefs. The flow of power and blessing is blocked when we believe lies. Personal and situational transformation results from intentionally renewing our minds with truth. The truth that's found in scripture. The question of the hour as you move on from Karenport High School is not, Lord, tell me what to do. But it is, Lord, tell me what to believe. And you've had an, we've had an awesome opportunity, you've had an awesome opportunity to really understand what to believe. Right believing will cause right doing. And as a transformed experience, and a transformed experience in the promises of God. I'm going to read that again. Right believing will cause right doing and a transformed experience in the promises of God. More of that basic thinking that we need to, to learn uh, can be found in Psalm 2, verse 4, where it states that God laughs in heaven. What is God laughing at in the, in the psalm? He's laughing at what his enemies are saying and planning. We can become more like God by laughing at the ridiculousness of Satan's lies, and this is the basis of the title of Vakman's book. Let's just laugh at that. Remember, Satan is the father of lies, and there is no truth in him, according to John 8:44. Another truth uh, to grasp, we have to let go of something in order to laugh. Just as disagreeing family members sometimes have to let go of something so they can laugh together, Christians often have to let go of things like manipulation, uh, bitterness, and or unbelief to laugh. And in Genesis 3, 11, God asked Adam, who told you that? This is an important question for us too after we declare something that is contrary to God's perspective about our circumstances or our own identity. We have to stop and say, what, where's that voice coming from? Who told us that? Often it's a lie. There are many lies that we buy into when we conform to this world. Some common lies that we buy into and this might be a big one for the stage of life that you're at, that I'm not physically attractive enough to be significant. For the girls, it might be, uh, you know, beauty. For the guys, it might be height or amount of muscle, all of that. The whole body image and how we feel about ourselves. We sometimes believe that if we're not physically attractive enough, we uh, can't be significant, and that is a lie. 
The laughable assumptions behind this lie include thoughts like, my physical flaws define who I am and everyone looks better than me. Or only truly beautiful and handsome people can truly can be truly happy. Or those who have good looks have lesser problems in life. Or being sexy is absolutely necessary for happiness and influence. Or nobody but me struggles with ne negative feelings about their looks. Or if I'm overweight at all, then I should feel miserable about myself. But the truth is, so those are all the lies. The truth is, there are qualities much more important than physical attractiveness. Uh, one of them, one example is loving God is far more important. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Having faith is more important. Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. Loving others, again more important than good looks. 1 Corinthians 13, 3, but if I have not love, it profits me nothing. Or, uh, and lastly, having integrity and making godly decisions far more important than that lie that physical attractiveness is the most important thing. Luke eleven twenty eight 28 says, Blessed or happy are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So the lie, we know what the lies are, we know what the truth is. Declarations that we need to learn to practice to say to ourselves to help renew our mind are uh, th statements like, my beauty on the inside makes me attractive to the right people on the outside. My face shines because of the presence of God in my life. I have a healthy self-image that creates favor on me, and those who are apparently more beautiful than me do not intimidate me, but I bless them and I choose to be a strength in their lives. Another lie that we commonly buy is, Fear of punishment is how God primarily motivates us. The laughable assumption between, uh, behind this lie is that Christ died, what Christ did on the cross may have saved me from my sins, but I still deserve to be punished for them. Another lie is parents and God need to create a climate of fear or else sin will increase. Another lie, I only learn and mature through fear, pain, and suffering. Another lie, a revelation of God's goodness does not lead people to repentance. Another lie, God's love does not change people, but the fear of punishment will. Another lie, people respond best to threats of punishment. The truth is, God's love is a new covenant's motivation for people. In Luke 15, 15, I just love this story, the story of the prodigal. The prodigal father Father, the prodigal's father motivated his son by showing him love. In a culture that didn't display love, the father ran to his son. John, John 8, 1 to 11. The adulterous woman was empowered to sin no more through forgiveness. The power of forgiveness the power of understanding, the forgiveness that we've received. Luke 7, uh, 39 to 50, Jesus told Simon the Pharisee that those who understand how much they are loved and forgiven by God will have a correlating inner compulsion to extravagantly love God. So we have the lie, we have the truth. What declarations can we, can we commit to our mind to transform us? God really loves us. He is absolutely crazy about us and wants nothing but the best for us. God will show us the way to walk in life by demonstrating his goodness to us. Jesus became a curse so that I would not have to bear a curse. I get to walk in blessing, not punishment, because of what he has done. What he has done, what Jesus has done. It all comes down to what we believe. Will we believe the truth that leads to hope? Or will we believe the lie that leads to doubt and despair? In my own life, I'm learning daily to examine my, examine my inner talk. Have you ever done that? Have you ever written down your inner talk every morning, what your mind is telling you? 
It's actually really cool if you do it. I'd encourage it. To test my thoughts, to know the difference between the truth and the lie. So what truth am I believing at the start of the day? And where is that truth coming from? A main way to renew our minds is to declare the truth in our own hearing. Remember in Matthew 4, 1 to 11, when Jesus was being tempted in the desert, he did not think his way out of the wilderness. Rather, he spoke truth to counteract challenges concerning his identity and the nature of his father. So dear graduates, as you move on, we encourage you to know the truth that leads to hope, to speak the truth in all situations and circumstance you face in life. The truth will renew your mind and bring you freedom. Thank you very much.